four, part two of Xenophon's Anabasis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. Anabasis by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book four, part two. Number three. During this day they bivouacked in the villages which lie above the plain of the river Contrites, which is about two hundred feet broad. It is the frontier river between Armenia and the country of the Carduchians. Here the Hellenes recruited themselves, and the sight of the plain filled them with joy, for the river was but six or seven furlongs distant from the mountains of the Carduchians. For the moment, then, they bivouacked right happily. They had their provisions— they had also many memories of the labours that were now past, seeing that the last seven days spent in traversing the country of the Carduchians had been one long continuous battle, which had cost them more suffering than the whole of their troubles at the hands of the king and Tissaphernes put together. As though they were truly quit of them for ever, they laid their heads to rest in sweet content. But with the morrow's dawn, they espied horsemen at a certain point across the river, armed cap a pie, as if they meant to dispute the passage. Infantry, too, drawn up in line upon the banks above the cavalry, threatened to prevent them debouching into Armenia. These troops were Armenian, and Mardian, and Chaldean mercenaries, belonging to Arontas and Artuchas. The last of the three, the Chaldeans, were said to be a free and brave set of people, they were armed with long wicker shields and lances. The banks before named on which they were drawn up were a hundred yards or more distant from the river, and the single road which was visible was one leading upwards and looking like a regular artificially constructed highway. At this point the Hellens endeavoured to cross, but on their making the attempt the water proved to be more than breast deep, and the river bed was rough with great slippery stones, and as to holding their arms in the water, it was out of the question. The stream swept them away, or if they tried to carry them over the head, the body was left exposed to the arrows and other missiles. Accordingly, they turned back and encamped there by the bank of the river. At the point where they had themselves been last night, up on the mountains, they could see the Carduchians collected in large numbers and under arms. A shadow of deep despair again descended on their souls whichever way they turned their eyes. In front lay the river so difficult to ford. Over on the other side, a new enemy threatening to bar the passage. On the hills behind, the Carduchians ready to fall upon their rear should they once again attempt to cross. Thus for this day and night they halted, sunk in perplexity. But Xenophon had a dream. In his sleep he thought that he was bound in fetters, but these, of their own accord, fell from off him, so that he was loosed and could stretch his legs as freely as he wished. So, at the first glimpse of daylight, he came to Chirisophus and told him that he had hopes that all things would go well, and related to him his dream. The other was well pleased, and with the first faint gleam of dawn the generals all were present and did sacrifice, and the victims were favourable in the first essay. Retiring from the sacrifice, the generals and officers issued an order to the troops to take their breakfasts, and while Xenophon was taking his, two young men came running up to him, for every one knew that, breakfasting or supping, he was always accessible, or that even if asleep any one was welcome to awaken him, who had anything to say bearing on the business of war. What the two young men had at this time to say was that they had been collecting brushwood for fire and had presently espied on the opposite side, in among some rocks which came down to the river's brink, an old man and some women and little girls depositing, as it would appear, bags of clothes in a cavernous rock. When they saw them, it struck them that it was safe to cross. In any case, the enemy's cavalry could not approach at this point. So they stripped naked, expecting to have to swim for it, and with their long knives in their hands began crossing, but going forward crossed without being wet up to the fork. Once across, they captured the clothes, and came back again. 
Accordingly, Xenophon at once poured out a libation himself, and bade the two young fellows fill the cup and pray to the gods, who show to him this vision and to them a passage, to bring all other blessings for them to accomplishment. When he had poured out the libation, he at once led the two young men to Chirisophus, and they repeated to him their story. Chirisophus, on hearing it, offered libations also, and when they had performed them, they sent a general order to the troops to pack up ready for starting, while they themselves called a meeting of the generals, and took counsel how they might best effect a passage, so as to overpower the enemy in front without suffering any loss from the men behind and they resolved that Chirisophus should lead the van and cross with half the army, the other half still remaining behind under Xenophon, while the baggage animals and the mob of sutlers were to cross between the two divisions. When all was duly ordered, the move began, the young men pioneering them and keeping the river on their left. It was about four furlongs march to the crossing, and as they moved along the bank, the squadrons of cavalry kept pace with them on the opposite side. But when they had reached a point in a line with the fort, and the cliff-like banks of the river, they grounded arms, and first Chirisophus himself placed a wreath upon his brows, and throwing off his cloak, resumed his arms, passing the order to all the rest to do the same, and bade the captains form their companies in open order in deep columns, some to left and some to right of himself. Meanwhile, the soothsayers were slaying a victim over the river, and the enemy were letting fly their arrows and sling-stones, but as yet they were out of range. As soon as the victims were favourable, all the soldiers began singing the battle hymn, and with the notes of the pion mingled the shouting of the men, accompanied by the shriller chant of the women, for there were many women in the camp. So Chirisophus with his detachment stepped in. But Xenophon, taking the most active body of the rear guard, began running back at full speed to the passage facing the egress into the hills of Armenia, making a feint of crossing at that point to intercept their cavalry on the river bank. The enemy, seeing Chorisophus's detachment easily crossing the stream, and Xenophon's men racing back, were seized with the fear of being intercepted, and fled at full speed in the direction of the road which emerges from the stream but when they were come opposite to it, they raced uphill towards their mountains. Then Lycius, who commanded the cavalry, and Isogenes, who was in command of the division of light infantry attached to Chirisophus, no sooner saw them fleeing so lustily than they were after them, and the soldiers shouted not to fall behind, but to follow them right up to the mountains. Chirisophus, on getting across, forbore to pursue the cavalry, but advanced by the bluffs which reached to the river, to attack the enemy overhead, and these, seeing their own cavalry fleeing, seeing also the heavy infantry advancing upon them, abandoned the heights above the river. Xenophon, as soon as he saw that things were going well on the other side, fell back with all speed to join the troops engaged in crossing, for by this time the Carduchians were well in sight, descending into the plain to attack their rear. Chirisophus was in possession of the higher ground, and Lycius, with his little squadron, in an attempt to follow up the pursuit, had captured some stragglers of their baggage-bearers, and with them some handsome apparel and drinking-cups. The baggage-animals of the Hellens, and the mob of non-competents, were just about to cross, when Xenophon turned his troops right about to face the Carduchians. Vis-a-vis, he formed his line, passing the order to the captains each to form his company into sections, and to deploy them into line by the left, the captains of companies and lieutenants in command of sections to advance to meet the Carduchians, while the rear leaders would keep their position facing the river. But when the Carduchians saw the rear guard so stripped of the mass, and looking now like a mere handful of men, they advanced all the more quickly, singing certain songs the while. Then, as matters were safe with him, Chirisophus sent back the peltasts and slingers and archers to join Xenophon, with orders to carry out his instructions. They were in the act of recrossing, when Xenophon, who saw their intention, sent a messenger across, bidding them wait there at the river's brink without crossing. But as soon as he and his detachment began to cross, they were to step in facing him in two flanking divisions, right and left of them, as if in the act of crossing the javelin men with their javelins on the thong, 
and the bowmen with their arrows on the string, but they were not to advance far into the stream. The order passed to his own men was, Wait till you are within slingshot, and the shield rattles, then sounds the pion, and charge the enemy. As soon as he turns, and the bugle from the river sounds for the attack, you will face about to the right, the rear rank leading, and the whole detachment falling back and crossing the river as quickly as possible, every one preserving his original rank, so as to avoid trammelling one another. The bravest man is he who gets to the other side first. The Carduchians, seeing that the remnant left was the merest handful, for many even of those whose duty it was to remain, had gone off in their anxiety to protect their beasts of burden, or their personal kit, or their mistresses, bore down upon them valorously, and opened fire with slingstones and arrows. But the Hellens, raising the battle hymn, dashed at them at a run, and they did not await them, armed well enough for mountain warfare, and with a view to sudden attack followed by speedy flight. They were not by any means sufficiently equipped for an engagement at close quarters. At this instant, the signal of the bugle was heard. Its notes added wings to the flight of the barbarians. But the Hellens turned right about in the opposite direction, and betook themselves to the river with what speed they might. Some of the enemy, here a man and there another, perceived, and running back to the river, let fly their arrows and wounded a few. But the majority, even when the Hellens were well across, were still to be seen pursuing their flight. The detachment which came to meet Xenophon's men, carried away by their valour, advanced further than they had need to, and had to cross back again in the rear of Xenophon's men, and of these two, a few were wounded. Number four. The passage effected, they fell into line about midday, and marched through Armenian territory, one long plain with smooth rolling hillocks, not less than five parasangs in distance, for owing to the wars of this people with the Carduchians, there were no villages near the river. The village eventually reached was large, and possessed a palace belonging to the satrap, and most of the houses were crowned with turrets. Provisions were plentiful. From this village they marched two stages, ten parasangs, until they had surmounted the sources of the river Tigris, and from this point they marched three stages, fifteen parasangs, to the river Teleboas. This was a fine stream, though not large, and there were many villages about it. The district was named Western Armenia. The lieutenant governor of it was Tiribasus, the king's friend, and whenever the latter paid a visit, he alone had the privilege of mounting the king upon his horse. This officer rode up to the Hellens with a body of cavalry, and sending forward an interpreter, stated that he desired a colloquy with the leaders. The generals resolved to hear what he had to say, and advancing on their side to within speaking distance, they demanded what he wanted. He replied that he wished to make a treaty with them, in accordance with which he on his side would abstain from injuring the Hellens, if they would not burn his houses, but merely take such provisions as they needed. This proposal satisfied the generals, and a treaty was made on the terms suggested. From this place they marched three stages, fifteen parasangs, through plain country, Turabasis the while keeping close behind with his own forces more than a mile off. Presently they reached a palace with villages clustered round about it, which were full of supplies in great variety. But while they were encamping in the night, there was a heavy fall of snow, and in the morning it was resolved to billet out the different regiments, with their generals, throughout the villages. There was no enemy in sight, and the proceeding seemed prudent, owing to the quantity of snow. In these quarters they had for provisions all the good things there are, sacrificial beasts, corn, old wines with an exquisite bouquet, dried grapes, and vegetables of all sorts. But some of the stragglers from the camp reported having seen an army, and the blaze of many watchfires in the night. Accordingly, the generals concluded that it was not prudent to separate their quarters in this way, and a resolution was passed to bring the troops together again. After that they reunited, the more so that the weather promised to be fine with a clear sky, 
but while they lay there in open quarters, during the night down came so thick a fall of snow that it completely covered up the stacks of arms and the men themselves lying down. It cramped and crippled the baggage animals, and there was great unreadiness to get up, so gently fell the snow as they lay there warm and comfortable, and formed a blanket, except where it slipped off the sleeper's shoulders, and it was not until Xenophon roused himself to get up, and, without his cloak on, began to split wood, that quickly first one, and then another got up, and taking the log away from him, fell to splitting. Thereat the rest followed suit, got up, and began kindling fire and oiling their bodies, for there was a scented unguent to be found there in abundance, which they used instead of oil. It was made from pig's fat, sesame, bitter almonds, and turpentine. There was a sweet oil also to be found, made of the same ingredients. After this, it was resolved that they must again separate their quarters and get under cover in the villages. At this news, the soldiers, with much joy and shouting, rushed upon the covered houses and the provisions. But all who in their blind folly had set fire to their houses when they left them before, now paid the penalty in the poor quarters they got. From this place, one night they sent off a party under Democrates, a Temenite, up into the mountains where the stragglers reported having seen watchfires. The leader selected was a man whose judgment might be depended upon to verify the truth of the matter. With a happy gift to distinguish between fact and fiction, he had often been successfully appealed to. He went and reported that he had seen no watchfires, but he had got a man, whom he brought back with him, carrying a Persian bow and quiver, and a cigaris or battle-axe like those worn by the Amazons. When asked from what country he came, the prisoner answered that he was a Persian, and was going from the army of Tirabasis to get provisions. They next asked him how large the army was, and for what object it had been collected. His answer was that it consisted of Tirabasis at the head of his own forces, and aided by some Chalibian and Tauchian mercenaries. Tirabasis had got it together, he added, meaning to attack the Hellens on the high mountain pass, in a defile which was the sole passage. End of Book 4 Part 2